welcome everyone to today's social system mapping sense making session for October 7th, 2024. Oh, I'm looking at the thing. Okay. And um, so what this is uh, for our, um, sorry to call you out, Tanya, but everybody knows this, but you, so you might as well know it yourself. <laughs> The, our one new new person who we haven't don't see regularly, which is um, so welcome. And I just wanna just wanna um, acknowledge that we're that we we love to have new people, and um, and there's a way we will want to prioritize your needs as we're having this conversation because we don't see you all the time, and and you know everybody else is there's there's new stuff for them in this today. But um, anyway, so I just wanted to. Uh, say for you, especially what this is, is a vision about my sharing my screen. I am. Mm -hmm. Yes. So this is a vision about a possibility, the possibility that social system mapping can help um, intentional networks um, become more effective more quickly. Um, it's also a learning opportunity to learn a little bit about um, social system mapping. It's an opportunity for us to hear, to get uh, in input from you, contribute your own in insight and experience about the things we're talking about today. And um, there's also a community of practice around this business of social system mapping. So that's what we're doing to here today. And um, our objectives are that you come away with a sense of the potential that we're inspired by, um, that you meet some cool people, and feel welcome by them, and that you end up, you leave at least a little bit curious about how social system mapping can support a network in learning how to deal with complexity, because that's the focus for today. And you'll see today we'll we'll introduce a framework that um, hopefully we'll, you'll find helpful. So um, our agenda today is we're gonna do some introductions in the chat in a moment. Uh, Amy will walk us through an overview of basics about social system mapping. We'll put you in breakouts. There's not a lot of us, so they'll be small. Um, and then um, just to introduce yourselves and say hi, get to know each other's context a little bit, we'll come back together. Uh, Amy will talk about how we think social system mapping, like our theory of transformation. And then I will talk about uh, the Human Systems Dynamics Landscape Diagram, which is also uh, another version of it is called the Stacy Matrix. And then we'll once we've gone through the landscape diagram, we'll put you into breakouts again. They'll be the same people. So you'll already have introduced yourselves and we'll give you some conversation prompts. And then we'll come back and review, depending on how the timing goes. Um, so, uh, when we're, uh, what we'd like, one of the things we'd like to, getting used to introducing this piece. <laughs> so so um, one of the things we wanted, we wanted to say is that if everything we do together is optional, it's, there's no command, there's no, um, you don't have to do anything. And, um, and that includes going into breakout rooms. So if you don't want to go into a breakout room, if you feel like, nah, I just, I'm not up for that. I just as soon turn my screen off and wait for people to come back. Um, please rename yourself and put an equal sign in front of your name. So that means don't put me in a breakout room. Um, if you're willing to facilitate uh, the conversation in the breakout room, you could rename yourself with an F in front of it. We're not going to need an N today, but I'm just sort of setting a norm. Um, if we were going to be using a social system map, we would ask someone to put an N in front of their name so that they could help uh, people who aren't comfortable navigating a map. They could be the navigators. And especially if you're, and another thing we that's very helpful for Kara in making uh, breakout groups that uh, stay, that, that are stable, is if you're going to leave early um, and you can't do the second breakout room, please put an L in front of your name so that Kara knows to make you an extra person in a group. Although we're small enough, we might not even have that. We might only have one group and it won't matter. But um, anyway, that's that's a 
uh, we're going to work on making this little quick announcement and hopefully everybody will get, we'll, we'll get really quick at it and it'll, everybody will get really comfortable with it over time. But I'm just um, modeling that today for future people, for people to do in the future, as well as asking for it. Okay. So then, um, <clears throat> oh, let's have you, Kara, I don't know if you've put the you put the um, the Mentimeter link into the chat. Let's have you put the Mentimeter link into the chat. And um, Tanya, are you comfortable with Mentimeter using Zoom and Mentimeter? Okay, great. So um, I don't need to explain how to toggle between the views. Um, and uh, you can open up that link and there will be um, a, a, a question in in the mentimeter where we're asking you to share your name pronouns location um and a, and a network that you're working with or thinking about um just a little bit about some kind of it's your connection to networks or a network because we sort of make the assumption that if you're with us you have some kind of network behavior going on <clears throat> Oh, and Nikki, welcome. I I saw your name show up and then I didn't see you because of the scrolling, like the space in my thing. So I just want to say welcome. I'm glad to have you join us as well. And um, Nikki, are you comfortable with Mentimeter? Okay, great. So once you've put your responses in, uh -huh, Nikki's in Portland with the Nutrition Oregon campaign. Uh, Curtis is in that neck of the woods, right, Curtis? Yeah, not today. I'm in Palm Springs, but more normally I'm in the PDX <laughs> area. Yeah. Uh, and and Curtis has become Curdy. That's, that's cute. Did, did, <laughs> did it? I tried three times to change my name. <clears throat> it's okay. You know who I am. Yes. Okay, um, and then there's Amy and Tom and Curtis and, and Mary. So Tanya's in Saskatoon in Canada, supporting an impact network being developed to enable older adults to engage to age in place. Well, there's not, it's not too long before that's gonna be an issue for me. So that's cool. Okay, um, next slide is, um, what's the possibility that you envision in the system that you're engaged in. So you all have a network that you're working with or thinking about, and um, what's the possibility that you're hoping that you're trying to move towards with that network? I'm assuming people are working on this question, but I'm not seeing any responses. Changing the way we think and work. Yeah. That's the whole topic of today. Holistic well being. Yeah. Who's having a voice? Mm. Movement to more system thinking level growth. Great. First, the network is meaningful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to move to the next slide, which is a quick question about how familiar you are with social system mapping. I know some of you are really familiar, and my guess is some of you are less so, but I would like to see how much less so. And we have another. Mm 
welcome Livia. Is it Livia? Lavia? Lavia. Lavia. Got the 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 stress in the wrong place of the word. Okay, Lavia, thanks. Um, we're just getting started. We're um we've uh introduced ourselves in the in a Mentimeter, which I'm not gonna back up, but if you would um like to put um your name, location, pronouns, and a network that you're working with in the chat. We would love to see that when we get to a pause. Um, but feel free to to not do that as well if if it's too much jumping in at the last at this point. Um, and then in the um uh in we also have a Kara, would you put the Mentimeter link back in the chat again so Olivia can access that? And um I'm going to go ahead and move forward. But we're asking about people's familiarity with social system mapping. And it looks like we have sort of some familiarity in general, but maybe um, anyway, doesn't matter that much, but I wanted to know. OK, so I'm going to hand it off to Amy now. Amy's going to walk us through basics about social system mapping. Um, and then, Livia, just one last thing. We're going to do breakouts. Uh, a couple times in this session, probably. And if you don't want to be in a breakout room, just um, would you just let Kara know that you'd prefer not to go into a breakout room? Just put in the chat, I don't want to, or direct message. Great. Livia's in Tucson. Cool. Okay. Thank you for sharing that, Livia. Um, and Amy, okay. I'm going to stop talking. Amy's going to take over. Great. <laughs> well, I'm going to probably take about the next 10 or 15 minutes to share a few ideas and concepts with you that inform social system mapping. So one of the ways that we think about social system mapping is that it is a synthesis of several other types of maps. And you may be familiar with some of these other types of maps. But a social system map, it includes dimensions of each of these maps and also tracks parts of these maps over time. So it's multidimensional, it, it tracks over time, and it is rich with information. And so mining this rich information that it contains requires process. So we often say that social system mapping is a process more than a product. Social system mapping is online, it's interactive and it's ac accessible to everyone in your network. And social system mapping is iterative, it's emergent, it's dynamic, and it is something that invites us to work as a group or a collective to do ongoing sense-making and sense-making being the topic for today's session. The purpose of a social system map is to support a global movement to shift from systems of dominance, exploitation and extraction to systems of connection, reverence and regeneration. And I always feel like I need to pause here just to let these words sink in. And I personally love how the language that we have here in these shifts, in th these shifts have informed my work over the last 20 plus years in one way or another. And I imagine that since you are here this morning that you also maybe can find your life's work um, in this shift that's represented in these words as well. So social system mapping is intended then to support me and to support you and to support all of us in accelerating the systems shifting work that we're already engaged in. And so in this community of practice, we talk about two conditions that are required to shift systems of dominance, exploitation, and extraction to systems of connection, reverence, and regeneration. One of those conditions is strong networks that include wise change agents. So you're likely here also because you already know that the types of intractable social 
problems facing us today require a network approach. And to have strong networks, you may also know that we need individuals who are watching and shepherding the network with intentionality and mindfulness. And so together, as we show up in these Monday Zoob spaces that Christine convenes, we grow our individual and our collective capacity to be wise change agents in whatever system we find ourselves. And this increase in capacity has us also integrating two fundamental shifts into our being, while we also are inviting and nurturing this, these shifts in our networks. And so I wanna talk about the two, two shifts. The first one I wanna talk about is a relational shift. And particularly for me, uh, being from the U.S., and maybe for you, if you were also from the U.S., I think of this idea of the myth of rugged individualism that I have been conditioned under. And the relational shift begins when we step outside of that myth and recognize that we are not just solo actors, but we live and we grow and we fail and we succeed in webs of connections with others. Uh, not, just human, not just connections with humans, but with all of creation and maybe even beyond, depending on how you think about these things. So relational shift. And the second shift that we talk about is a cognitive shift. And in this shift, we are in inviting and growing in our ability to move from seeing the world in a mechanistic way in sort of a, a linear cause and effect way and moving from a either or world to a both and world and to embracing a complex systems worldview. And so when we embrace complexity thinking, we can't always predict what will happen when we push lever A because we find and we become comfortable with emergence. And in fact, we begin to look for and expect emergence in all of our either or thinking hopes we hope to replace with a both and, just an openness, a curiosity. And so the colors are significant in the graphics that I'm showing you today. The orange represents the relational shift that we're nurturing and paying attention to. And the purple represents the cognitive shift, this complex thinking, complexity uh, mindset that we are seeking to embrace. And at any given time, I might be attending to one of those shifts or the other, but we need both to be happening. And as we shift one, it's gonna impact the other. And so this slide reminds us that these two shifts, relational and cognitive, are really two perspect perspectives on the same theme, thing. So the invitation to me, to you, is to look from both angles regularly and together as a community. And so social system mapping helps us make these shifts, relational and cognitive. So I want to pause now and invite us to go into breakout rooms. And during your breakout time, I'd love to invite you to just briefly introduce yourself again, even though you put it in the Bentimeter, introduce yourself in a network or system that you're working in, maybe one that kind of informs you showing up today. And then as there's time, maybe a possibility that you hope comes out of your work with that particular network or social system. And Kara will put us into breakout rooms. And Kara, I think, can we take five minutes? We can. I have one facilitation question. I would have a group of two and a group of three, unless maybe Amy was willing to join a group to round it out. So we'd have two groups of three. I will join a group, Kara. Thank okay. you. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for your willingness. So let me just add you in, and then we'll be all set to go. Mm. 
Welcome back. Just waiting for Mary and Tom. Mm -hmm. We have 23 seconds if they don't come back on their own. I think it doesn't it automatically close them. It will at the end of the timer here. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're all back. Trust that you had some good conversation and got to learn a little bit about each other. Let me share my screen again. So now I want to share a little bit with you about how engaging the tools and process of social system mapping can support systems transformation. And so we, in our community of practice, refer to what I'm going to share with you as, as our theory of transformation. So we, we, we start this theory um, with thinking about a group of us the people or the organizations that are working on the ground. And maybe this is across a city or even across the globe. And these people or institutions, but let's say people for my explanation, may be learning together already. They may be in cohorts, but maybe not, and maybe not coordinated. And some of them may not even be aware of the others. And so we, some of us begin to sense that many of us are working toward a common purpose. And so I know in my breakout room, I got to learn a little bit about the purpose that Nikki's working toward and the one that Tanya's working for. And so we realize that some of us are working towards a common purpose and we start to experience our work towards that common purpose, bringing us in closer proximity to each other. And then a subset of us, we sometimes refer to this as the core, but a subset of us begins to sense the potential for increased impact if we could begin to connect more of us. And so here in the middle, we've got a few, few people who are like building relationships with each other and realizing that there might be more potential here if we could bring more of us together. And so this group, usually this group in the middle, begins to set their intentions on gathering more and more of the field. And the core begins engaging others in convenings. And so you have this orange swath growing as we're bringing more together. And so maybe the, the folks in the center are making introductions and closing triangles and generally helping to build and strengthen relationships. The core then starts to say, well, how could we see our members and our connections, our network better? They might ask, how might visualizing the network help members take more agency, do more self-organizing, and ultimately have greater impact toward, toward the shared purpose? So the core makes a map. And what we see here with the arrows is, coming up the, the left side, we have the data for this map coming directly from the members themselves. And then the data is available back to the members. And this is our first representation of a social system map. Here, we're using the tool SumApp that Christine and her partner, Tim, developed as our data collection tool. This is allowing the people themselves or the organizations themselves to input their own information directly in the map. And then the, the data feeds into Kumu to create the visualization. And so that all of the data about the members, their connections and the visualization is made available to the members. And this system, social system map, begins to set the conditions for even more relational shifts. So we'll start to see the orange growing and eventually also sets the conditions for the cognitive shifts. 
the core uses the map strategically, maybe to make some more introductions, to inform offerings. And we have some of the members using the map, but we also see that eventually the core kind of steps in to help integrate the map into more of the network activities. So they might spend time helping members use the map and discover additional value from it. The core themselves use the map to discover prompts for dialogue and for learning. They use the map to build a shared understanding of the field, of the network, and to strategize together. You also may have noticed now we got some more energy in our core as new members um, begin to join. And all along, the map is iterating. It's getting better input from a wider range of members. The content is changing and the map is getting more data that is more aligned with the needs of the network. So these white lines, if you've noticed, they start to kind of curve in a little bit. And this represents that the data is getting more and more aligned with the purpose in the members of the network. So now you see a little bit of purple coming in. So now we've got the core and the members starting to use the map as a systems thinking tool. They are helping the network practice complexity thinking and having a complexity mindset, using the map for seeing and understanding and influencing patterns in the network. And all along the network continues to inform and reform the content of the map. So more and more, we're having new questions, new data, a larger population represented on the map so that the data becomes increasingly integrated with the values, purpose, and identity of the network and its members. And then we're having more purple, more orange as we increase convening and hosting and resources are flowing. We've got an increase in our collective ability to do systems thinking. We are increasing our shared understanding across important differences in our network. And the network starts to increase its understanding of how the practice and learning that they're gaining can be applied to the broader systemic shifts that they're trying to create, even beyond the boundaries of the network itself. We, again, keep iterating. The map keeps changing and the data and the map become more integrated into the activities and the shared awareness and the potential within this network until we have everything sort of converging here. We've got the data, the map, the mindsets, the relationships and the actions integrated and aligned. The system sees itself. It has self-awareness. It's a learning organization. Thus, we are now at the point of maximizing its transformational impact. So this is what we call our theory of transformation and how we think a social system map, social system mapping can support our, our change efforts that all of us are doing across the screen. Christine? That was great, thank you. Um, yeah, and I'll just say, if, if you stick around, you'll you'll also hear us refer to that as the vortex. That's our shorthand is it's the vortex because it looks like a vortex. We had a big discussion as we were designing the whole thing uh, about if vortexes were too scary and <laughs> we decided that that's what it was. And so let's go with it. Um, okay, and so today I'm gonna talk about, let me just get my, um, share my screen. Hmm. Um, okay. So as I said, I'm going to talk about the landscape diagram and or the Stacy matrix and or the Canavan framework. If you've heard that, they all are, um, there's components of all of them synthesized together in what I'm going to share with you today. They're all sort of variations on a similar theme, which has to do with um, a key component of systems thinking and complexity thinking is understanding what kind of state the system is in as you're trying to intervene with it. There's different, uh, some systems are very unstable and some, some systems are stable. 
And we're going to uh, dig into that. Um, and so first I'm going to go into the landscape diagram a bit, and then I'm going to connect it up to system to, to social system mapping. Um, and so the, the diagram is basically a two by two matrix of identifying where we identify um, how close the system is to agreement. So if it's very close to agreement, it's down at the bottom uh, left-hand corner. Um, meaning agreement, meaning we all have shared understanding. We're all on the same page. We all think we want to go in the same direction. We're very aligned in terms of uh, not only purpose, but uh, just uh, you know the, the, the things that we need to know in order to get to our purpose um, or what our purpose is. So the further we get from agreement, the further we go up to this, this area, if you can see my cursor and then the other and wait before i keep yapping for a moment i just want to ask those especially those of you who are new um who haven't been with us before if you have seen this before if you've if you've seen this diagram before just give me a hands up okay and tanya you have it looks like great um okay so um in this yeah so, so the closer we are to agreement, the further we're down here, the further we are from agreement, it moves up here. And then this is, this axis is called uh, from, from um, in the Stacy matrix, they call this certainty. And um, um, I have gone back and forth in thinking about how to like talk, how do we talk about this? And what I've landed on recently is that certainty basically means um, we know how to get there. We know how to do this. So the more we know how, like the technical aspects of how, not the emotional aspects, not the social aspects, but the, like, if there are, uh, this impacts that whenever you've got anything like technological, like a spaceship or a car or a social system map, um, how, how close to we, are we to knowing how it's going to work at every step of the way and how far are we from knowing how it's going to work at every step of the way. So that's, the, the initial axis is the agreement and the certainty. Um, the next pair of axes, or I mean, those are the axes. And in um, in the Stacy matrix, Stacy talked about if we're if we're far from agreement, but not super far from knowing how. It's just that we're we're far, we're far from uh, agreeing on what to change or what where we want to go. <clears throat> that's a socially complicated system. So if we're, well, let me start down here. If we're, if we have a lot of agreement and a lot of certainty, we've got a simple system, like the electrical wiring in your house is mostly a s simple system. Like I'd say McDonald's is a fairly simple system. I mean, it's huge, it's global, but they've got their, you know, they've got their, how this happens. Everybody agrees we're selling burgers. You know, that's been codified for a very, very, very long time. Um, it's a relatively stable system. Um, in if, if we have less agreement about what we're go doing or where we're headed, that's a socially complicated system. A socially complicated system can be very turbulent. Um, I'll come back to that in a moment. If we're in, uh, if, if we are pretty much in agreement, like, yes, we want to send a spaceship to the moon. We all agree that's our goal here. We want to send a spaceship to the moon, but we're not exactly certain how we're going to do it. What is the, what are the technology necessary? What are the, the ways this part will impact that part? Um, that's a technically complicated system. That's in a technically con complicated system is unstable. And I just was re re thinking about this recently and I, I started to think about why, like we've got these words turbulent and unstable that I got from somewhere once upon a time. And um, the, the, the technically complicated piece was a little hard to talk about until I came to what oh, has to do with like actually the technique for getting there. How are we gonna get there? And then it made a lot more sense than Sometimes we're talking about technology and sometimes we're talking about something else like the dynamics of a broad system, like an economy um, isn't technology necessarily, but it still is a technically complicated system. Um, 
So that can clear this this business about certainty, meaning certainty about how we're going to go there, not certainty about what we're going to do or that we're all on the same page, but how the process. And then, um, then I was thinking again recently about this business about the difference between turbulent and unstable. And I realized that a, a key thing is that an unstable system can seem stable for a very long time. It can look like it's stable, but if it's technically complicated, it's it, it's internally breakable and we don't necessarily know when it's going to break. So like, think of like, uh, you know, some of the major disasters like the Challenger crash. That was a very technically complicated system. Everybody was, you know, had the same goal, but there, you know, they had not fully coordinated all of the understanding of what will happen if this, then that, and it crashed. So um, it's a very small piece of, of breakdown that turned into a, a huge disaster. And so I started to realize, oh, so unstable means it's not turbulent. If it's turbulent, it's always moving. And you can kind of sense, you know, like the, you know, it's always moving, so I can't ground myself. I don't know where to how to how to land here. Um, that's one kind of like cognitive challenge. But technically complicated, an unstable system is a different kind of cognitive challenge. It's like it seems fine, it seems fine, it seems fine until until it doesn't. And um, or you know, there's like with our software, there's lots of little times when oh, that's not working anymore. Oh, because we, we we updated this and oh, we broke that, and so that that's a kind of instability. So socially complicated, technically complicated, and then if it's both, you know, relatively high in uncertainty and relatively high in social complication, then we get into the zone of complexity, and this is where we have to, and um. I thought it was interesting when I was thinking about this recently because I hadn't really, when I was thinking about and sort of codifying, you know, we have the relational shift and we have the the cognitive shift. I wasn't thinking about socially complicated and technically complicated, but I recently was looking at this and I was like, oh yeah, duh, they fit. You know, like we need to make a strong relational shift if we're in a socially complicated space and we don't, it doesn't need to be um, super cognitive. But if we're moving, if we're in a place where we're, it's technically cognitive, then we, then we have, uh, I'm getting sped up and ahead of myself. For those of you who are new, this happens. <laughs> uh, uh, so it's like the more technically complicated it is, the more important it is for us to start to look at cause and effect and make sure that we're checking for um, for breakages. We, we start to under, un, look for that sort of thing. And in the zone of complexity, this is both a sort of uh, a zone where things can fall apart, but it's also a zone where things can come together. So this is also, some people would call this the zone of emergence and not complexity, but where, um, uh, depending on what's going on on the conditions that you're setting, um, you can have, I mean, that, those conditions are what's gonna make a difference. So um, I think I'm, okay. I'm gonna just pause there and see if anybody has a clarifying question before I go to the next step. Okay, and um, if you have clarifying questions because I can't see everybody, on the screen right now, raising your your technical hand, your Zoom hand, as opposed to your physical hand, will be helpful to me. Um, or unmuting and just voicing in when I'm saying, "Does anybody have any questions?" Um, which I'm not seeing at the moment. So I'm going to go ahead and move to the next slide, which is that the point of identifying where we are in a system. So it's like, that's all kind of interesting, but you know, there's a level of like, so what? So there's complex systems. So sometimes systems are more stable, et cetera. Like who cares? What, what, what is that? What does that have to do with my goal? And um, what it has to do with my goal or our goals is that if we're depending on the, the conditions of the system, we need to interact with the system very differently. 
So in a stable system, we know what cause and effect are. They're obvious. We've got that figured out. And so in a, in a stable system, um, we, oh, let me, let me just notice that I'm getting ahead of myself, which is what happens when I get sped up and I'm not paying attention to my notes anymore. Okay. So the one thing I'll say about, about the, um, in a complex system or an emergent system, the more, the more it's heading up towards where things fall apart, the more complex it is, the more it's characterized by, and this is the piece I wanted to say on this slide, is just um, interconnectedness so that multiple parts are influencing each other. And if we're up in the zone of complexity, we've got both technical, how-to things impacting um, social uh, agreement things. So we might have some answers, but people don't like them, or people might have a sense of a way forward, but they don't work given the context because of cause and effect. So we're there's a lot we need to be taken into consideration. And no matter how much we take it into consideration, we're, we're never going to be able to predict exactly what will happen because there's too many parts. Um, so the, the interconnectedness is a characteristic of the zone of complexity. Um, the there's also a non-linearity going on where teeny tiny changes like I, I mentioned like the in the challenger disaster it was what it was like a something hit one of the tiles on the outside of the spaceship something like that it was a very small thing but it created this huge impact and so often so non-linear interactions means that small things can have really outsized impacts and importantly, likewise, and we see this in networks a lot, really huge efforts can have no impact <laughs> because we don't really know uh, what will work. And so we're putting a lot of energy into something we think will work without testing to see if it will or it won't. Um, and so, so it's characterized again by interconnectedness, nonlinear interactions, and then lastly, emergence, meaning that that new properties can come can arise from the interaction of smaller and simpler components. Given all the causes and effects and the um, and the nonlinear interactions, we we don't we not only can we not predict what will happen, often things will happen that we couldn't have seen or we we didn't that didn't exist before. So again, zone of complexity or emergence is is really difficult to predict or to control the behavior of. And um, the point I was starting to make, and I'll go to now, is that if we are behaving as if the system is simple and interacting with it as if we know how to make it work and everyone's in agreement, and that's not true, we run the risk of lots of unintended consequences and nonlinear uh, interactions that can be far, far, far from what we were hoping to do. So in that, um, so I'm gonna just pause here and um, see if there's any more questions. And then I wanna, I'm gonna take us through some, and this is a new thing. I haven't done this before using Mentimeter. So if some of you have done this with Mentimeter, yay, maybe if we get stuck, you can help me, but um, otherwise we'll, we'll, hopefully it will work, but um, we're, we'll put pins on on some of these landscape diagrams for for our opinions about some things. So, but first, any question, clarifying questions um, about anything that it would be helpful. Okay. So now if we could go back to our Mentimeter uh, interface and um, there should be, uh, I'm hoping, and maybe um, Amy, you could unmute and just affirm for me if what I'm saying looks true for you. Oh, maybe you're probably not in there, are you? in the Mentimeter voting, because you're presenting. Tom, would you do this with me? Or would you unmute? Are you in the Mentimeter? Yeah, I can see it. OK. And it, does it say, where are you most comfortable? And then there's a picture yes. of the matrix. And can you see a little black pinish kind of thing that you can move yes. around? OK. So then uh, if anybody, I'm hoping everybody else can see that and can find their pin and can move their pin into the the area of the, of the Stacy matrix where you feel most at home, most like you know what to do, most comfortable, like your preferred, most competent place. Um,
And I would say there's, for me personally, depends on the context. In some places I want stability like in my home, <laughs> but in out of, in other places I, I get tired of stability. So you just find a, wh whatever feels most up for you at the moment and don't worry too much about it. And let's see, how many people, how many votes should there be if we were all doing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six. So anyone is seven, okay. Um, okay, can every, and every, now can everybody just spend, uh, um, go back to my screen and see everyone's answers so we can sort of look at our distribution, which is somebody likes things very stable. Um, a handful of us like things sort of just at the, at the, at the cusp of emergence, but not too far. And one of us is fairly good with it being fairly technically complicated, but not so much with socially complicated. And oh, and I didn't I didn't put myself on here just just for the record. And um, someone is comfortable with a lot of technical complication and some social complication. Okay, so that's our personal um, our personal preferences. And then I'm gonna the next one. So I'm gonna ask you to do this again with the pin. Where do you think your network is in terms of its actual, not the not the norms of the network, but how that, you know, how complex is the network and and or the system, the thing that you're trying to change? Is it super socially complicated but simple? Is it super technically complicated, et cetera? So if you could put your pins where you think your network lives. Did I do that? Uh -huh. Wow. Um, so I want to make one point, which is that if we're doing this with a group um, and we ask the group, where do we think our networks, let, let's say it's a, it's a group that is like, it's a, it's a social, it's a, it's a network with a, with a goal. And we're talking to people in the network um, and we ask the people in the network, where do you think we are on this on this matrix? Mm -hmm. um, which is actually a really useful activity if you can find the time and get people to do it with you. Um, they will say different things. Some people will say, I think it's really simple. And other people will think I say, I think it's in chaos. And the the what I have seen happen is they will start to try to agree and find like the answer and my suggestion and what I find helpful is to say, there isn't an answer. It's, you know, we all feel differently about it. It's it's in relation to our own preferences, like what some people would call chaos, I would call like, you know, relatively unstable because I'm pretty used to chaos. So um, I don't go to chaos unless like, you know, houses are falling down in my mind or, you know, it's civil war. but. You know, so part of it has to do with where we normally prefer, but it also has to do with our position within the network. And so so having a little bit of a spiel about that and saying there isn't one right answer. And what's valuable about doing this together is to hear, why do you think this is a simple system? What makes you feel like this is, is in chaos? What makes you feel like this is socially complicated, but not technically complicated and vice versa. And so then it become a, a dialogue where we get uh, have an opportunity to to not argue with each other about who's right, but actually hear how each other's thinking about it and start to get some shared understanding that um, isn't about finding the correct answer. It's about actually hearing each other and understanding where each other's coming from and holding in our minds the, the fact that there are different perspectives on any reality. Um, okay, and then lastly, this is just a... a, a for our conversation together, where do you think, oh no, wait, I missed one. I'm gonna just go to the next one. Okay, where do you think social system mapping as an activity, as a process fits into the Stacy matrix of conditions? 
Those of you who are mappers, or if you're not, you could just guess. But where does it strike you as it? it's probably here or it's probably here? I'm not certain if we're done voting or not. Not voting, but pinning. Okay. Um. So I'm. Uh, this is. This is interesting to me. And I just want to double check. I forgot to make sure that everybody got a chance to look at the distribution of the where's your network. And so I'm just backing my screen up for a moment, which is our networks are, we're spread out. Everyone's like con concept of where their own network is, is there's a, there's a wide distribution tending towards the, you know, the, the, um, the complex, the complex zone, but it's fairly spread out. And I think it's interesting um, that that we're much closer together when we look at a social system map. And um, there were, and so, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna move to the next one. So here's kind of the. There's two main points I'm wanting to make with this discussion this morning. One of which is that um, uh, the, the landscape diagram will help us, and I'm gonna talk about the conditions for the systems that we wanna develop. Let me just do that instead of go to making my points yet. Um, but okay, there's two points, one of which is that Depending on the state, the state of the, the condition of the of the system, we need to interact with the system differently. It, it's how we interact to try and get a system to behave in the way that we would like it to behave, which is a, sounds really big and grandiose, but is is not by thinking that we can. Uh, is not a one size fits all. We have to understand the system uh, to begin with where it is, and then. Um, so that's one understanding, and two is has to do with social system mapping, which is that often we approach social system mapping as a as if the whole process is both technically simple and socially simple, and when we do that, we're less likely to have the impact for the social system map to have the impact that we're wanting it to have, but we're also less leveraging the the bit of comp uh, inherent complexity in social system mapping to develop our cognitive muscles, to develop our new mindsets and to practice. And that's the whole sort of like the process and the practice is a big point of, of doing a social system map. So um, in, in, so condition wise, in terms of where we are in a in a McDonald's kind of universe, we can we can say, here's the best practices. You do A, B, C, D, and E in this order, always this way. We can we can sort of we can we can codify it. In a socially complicated system, there are good practices. And I like to think of these as principles that we can that we can follow to to create the conditions in the system where we still can't predict and we can't control the outcomes, but we can say the conditions are going to support it moving in the direction we want. If we've created um, the, the if we've done the good practices and socially complicated, likewise in a technically complicated, we can have good practices, which is this like we have some we have these principles, we know the conditions we're trying to create, and we do that. And then in an emergent um, in a zone of complexity, we can't even say that ahead of time, really. We can say, 
um, here's how we hold the whole thing in our minds and how we engage with it. Um, and the, and the, and the right practices will emerge. And so those, um, in a very, this is a very simplified, reduced, uh, set of principles, but in a socially complicated system, we want to build relationships. We want to build trust and we want to create common ground. So all of this, you know, if we're talking about how we think the system is different, that's a way of creating common ground, actually listening to each other and hearing each other's perspective, as opposed to arguing about which answer is the correct answer. That's a way of building trust. Having those conversations at all is a way of building relationships. So we we kind of have a sense in network weaving circles that we need to build relationships and we need to build trust. And one of the points I'm trying to make is that we can use the process of making a social system map to, to help generate some of those conditions, the relationship building conditions. Often people will say, we're busy building relationships over here. And you know these two people over there who are geeks are gonna make the map. <laughs> and 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 um and it's not it's got nothing to do with building relationships. Once we see the map, then we'll see the relationships. But the the processes are separate. And I'm saying the more we can bring them together, the better. The more we're actually building in the conditions for a socially complicated, we're building relationships, and we're starting to see things similarly, or at least understand where each other's coming from. Um, in a technically complicated system, it's different. We don't. And this is a thing that I, I sometimes feel like we make a mistake with is we sort of feel like, okay, building relationships is the be all and end all and hearing every voice is going to get us where we go. And um, there's a piece of if, if there's a, there's a know how kind of thing, if there's, um, there's specialized knowledge that will help avoid you know, like the crashes and will help that we need to keep in mind in order as, as we're making our process going forward, that th that technically complicated uh, know-how or expertise or experience needs to be heard from as well and needs to be coordinated. And we need to, so there needs to just be experimenting. Like when we push a new change to some app, uh, first we have a theory about how this should work. Our developer makes the thing. And then Kara and Tim and I have to beat it up. We test it, test it, test it, and see, did it break? Did it break? What, where is it? And then finally we're like, okay, it's stable enough. <laughs> we're gonna push it out and move on to the next thing. But so coordinating our expertise and collaborating and experimenting are really important and technically complicated. In a, a complex system, we know that the that that we we have to do these good practices or create these conditions, and we also know that we have to combine them with these conditions. But what we don't know is to what degree and what does that actually mean in this context. It, and that's and we're and we need to 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 hold those all those unknowns in mind and continually be checking things out. And so, in a in a complex adaptive system context is got to always be kept in mind. We want to engage holistically, i.e. all of the parts, not just one angle on some of the parts, strengthening relationships, amplifying feedback and reflection. This is a really important thing. Um, I was thinking about this recently and I was thinking, okay, what's a metaphor? I don't generally do lots of examples and metaphors. I tend to stay, which is, everybody says is very helpful and I agree, but um, it's, it's, a, it's not my strength. But I was thinking, okay, what's it like? I was just thinking about in, I'm in Minnesota. In Minnesota, people like ice fish and they go out on frozen lakes, which I just find like the scariest thought. I just wouldn't do it, especially not in a truck, <laughs> but they do. And I was thinking of like walking across a, a, a lake with thin ice. So like a complex system is like a, a lake with thin ice. And you know you need to get to the other side, but you don't exactly know what underneath the, the water is creating thickerness or thinness. And so you don't really know where is a safe step. And so when when you're walking across the ice, you take a, you know, you sort of slide your foot. You don't go, you know, you don't do a big stomp. You sort of slide your foot gently forward and then you sort of gently put your weight on the next foot and then you sort of slide your foot gently forward. And so you're sort of doing this very creeping, tentative, 
and you know you you shift when you've shifted your weight then you're like listening for cracks in the ice or you're looking around to see if any cracks started and if a crack started you you sort of like shift your direction way in a different direction or you might back up and and that creeping across the ice is actually how we can be effective uh strong change agents in a complex system is not making huge not taking big jumps like off both feet and that's so like when I'm when I'm saying I want us to be adaptive and to, to like take a teeny tiny step and then reflect. So we get feedback and reflection. We're listening for the crack in the ice. We're looking for the crack in the ice. And then if nothing is, if it's going well, then we can say, oh, that worked. Cool. I'm going to do a little more of that, a little more of that. But we don't just start saying, oh, I have a theory that that direction is going to work. And I jump in that direction because we don't know that. And so that's that, that, that sort of thinking about crossing the lake a lake with thin ice sort of became the metaphor suddenly in my mind for adaptive action. Like that's how we move forward. We don't plan out a year's worth of activities and think that we're going to actually be able to do them. Um, and so that's also sensing where the energy is heading. So experimenting, sensing where the energy is heading is just sort of that shifting carefully and noticing not only, you know, is ice cracking, is there a threat, but also are people excited over here? You know, like I thought we should be marching off in this direction, but if they're actually like perking up and talking about this other direction, maybe that's gonna be the the, the more effective way to go. Okay, so that is in 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 um in terms of social system mapping, we do it the same way. We're sort of easing into. What are people ready to talk about? Maybe like, I think it's time for us to define the connection options, but they need to have five conversations about their discomfort with the connection options before we can do that. And, and so um, we're always sensing where's the openings and where are the resistances and what kind of conversations do we need to have in order to, to, to grapple with the resistances and also where what uh, technical assumptions are people making about what's possible in a map that aren't so we don't let them spend five hours making a plan that actually can't be, be implemented um and so just this iterative sensing into what actually does this map need to be um and combining that with the technical expertise this okay there's one more point i want to make and then i'm gonna stop talking which is um i keep saying to people we need to we need to shift our cognitive, you know, like we, we need to shift our mindset or, you know, like if you do a social system map, it will help you do this X or Y, which is in the, you know, in the complexity zone. And I realized I haven't made the case for why that's important yet. Like people, I, I step in and I start saying this is important. And people are looking at me like they're in their, you know, sort of McDonald's mindset and they don't, they're, they're like, well, that sounds really fancy and intimidating and like, okay, you're just being a, you know, an egghead who's trying to make everybody else feel dumb. And it's like, no, actually, that's not the goal. The goal is to actually be effective. And, but I haven't made the case. And so I suddenly realized, oh, this whole landscape diagram, Stacy matrix, if we, if we walk through it can really help us make the case for these changes in approach. Why do we need to do it this way? Um, and until we understand why it's so important to do it this way, we're going to keep doing it the same old way. So for us as practitioners of mapping, I recently came to realize, like, I've always loved this thing, the Stacy matrix. I was, that's really cool. I like to think about that. But I couldn't quite see exactly how to directly connect it to social system mapping. It's like, it doesn't have anything to do with social system mapping. But, and then recently I was like, no, it has everything to do with the process, not the outcome, but the process. And so that's what I wanted to share today. <sighs> okay, I am going to stop here and um, let's, okay, no, I'm going to say two more things about just the, the process. So, so all, all of our contention, we've all been making this case, but without maybe explaining why it matters, um, is that social system mapping can help us build those cognitive muscles and build them together in a way that both strengthens relationships and uh, because even thinking about how complex are we, what are the disagreements, where are we not aligned, what are the technical unknowns, um, doing that together is 
we don't ever have to use the necessarily use the words, but it is moving us up into the complexity, into the the area of being able to navigate in complexity. And so, um, um, and so social system mapping connects us both to like helps us practice it and apply it, and also do that together in a collective way. So that was the the where I wanted us to land on from what I was going to do, and then. Um, I'm seeing that we have like 18 minutes left and I had some conversation I wanted us to do in breakouts and I'm thinking we're a small enough group. I'm debating, Amy, what do you think if we just do it together for like we stay together for maybe 10 minutes and then we go, well, then if we stay together, we don't need to do the review piece because we're together. Um, and that'll give us a little more time for the for just open conversation. Like it. Okay. And so the questions that I wanted for the breakout, and we'll still keep to, is just for us to sort of share your what's coming up for you about the, the gaps that you're seeing both either in your own, like how I, how, where I'm comfortable and where I, my work needs to be, or in how my network is operating and how complex it actually is or isn't, or in our social system mapping process somewhere what is the is there a gap between how things are being approached and how um, they could be approached given how complex they are, and then what changes in practice could you imagine to reduce any of those gaps? So those are my questions, and I'm gonna just um, stop sharing my screen and turn off my little space heater, which is keeping my toes warm because it's cold in Minnesota, <laughs> and um, open it up. And I will um, also let's do this because uh, we are uh, adopting a practice of, of uh, selecting who speaks next based on whose voices we've already heard a bunch from or whose voices usually get heard. And, um, and in order to do that, I have to know who wants to speak, but not just say who's next and let them start speaking. I hope that makes sense. But you'll see how it works in practice in a moment. But so if you if you have a thing you'd like to share, please raise your electronic hand. Um, is everybody able to do that? I think. And um, and and then I will see whose hands are up and and make a choice about who to engage next. And um, and I see Tom's hand is up, and I want to um, prioritize if there's anybody who's not been around. Um, but Tom, we'll have you go ahead, and then we'll see if anybody, if if any new people put their hands up, I would move to them when you're done. Yeah, just on the gap. I'll just start with the landscape diagram itself. Um, picturing leadership team and whatever where we're implementing social system mapping, and their engagement on that. The map itself sometimes feels like it might. The landscape map as you presented it which i thought was wonderful and i want to have those discussions but that's sometimes a very small room that wants to have those discussions and yeah. i can sense the question is okay well how do we move this wherever they put the dot like how do we move it back to simple that yeah. would be like the goal yeah and yeah is that yeah well i don't think that's the goal right pardon me i don't think that is the goal it is well you know that's interesting that's um um this is interesting sarah shanahan and i of the reamp network recently did a systems thinking thing and um her sense was that when when her her training in hsd was um that yes our goal was to to, to identify where it is and figure out how to get it back to simple <laughs> And, and and so we had this big debate about how we're going to handle this conversation because I was like, you can't necessarily always get it back to simple, but um, and and maybe that isn't the goal. But but in thinking about it more, what I realize is there is a degree of um, dealing. So dealing with the complexity, but at some point you don't want to be in in like in crisis mode all the time, or you, you want to get to where the point where there are parts where there is some stability in the system. And so 
And another way I've been thinking about this is that in a, so like say our little community of practice, that the core group has has stable norms and stable practices and stable resources and access so that the core group can support more flux on the edges and 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 connect up the resources in the center to the flux on the edges. So you can't, like sometimes people will be like, everything should just all be chaos all the time and everybody should have every, you know, like, and and it's like, no, that's actually, so there, so there is, Tom, a way that moving towards simple or towards towards stability is part of the goal. But the question then is what part of the system should be moving towards stability? And the other thing is, and how are we gonna get there? We're gonna get there by engaging those conditions. We're not gonna get to stability by force and we're not gonna get to stability by just deciding and making a 10 step plan. We actually have to emerge and iterate ourselves down to a slightly more stable place to where we wanna be. Um, but we can't use the we can't use the the best practices in stability land to get us to, to stability if we're in complex land. We have to use the best practices of complex land to help move us to stability. So, if that's what they want, you know, it's like yeah, maybe that's not the ultimate goal, but you could build on that. <laughs> you can still use that to get them to recognize that they they if it's if it's complex they need to deal with complexity yeah. well, at least no... to keep them on the journey yeah yeah so not, not hopelessness which is you know, right and not telling them you have to deal with chaos forever because that or you know it, it like that just doesn't it even doesn't appeal to me <laughs> i don't have the energy for it anymore so that that chronic flux place yeah that'll just shut people down Thanks, Tom. Other sort of what's coming up for you? And if it doesn't fit in my little questions, that's fine. Just whatever's coming up for you that you'd like to share or inquire about. Okay, I'm gonna keep waiting. Curtis, my guess is you have some thoughts. How could you not? And I, my guess is that you're just being patient and and being and being um, equitable and not speaking first because one of our one of our understandings collectively here is that often white people speak more than people of color and often men speak more than women. And and uh, Curtis is very understanding of that and has been being patient. But now I see Amy's hands up, so I'm going to go with the Amy and Curtis. I'm going to I'm going to pick on you next if no one else raises their hand. You're muted. I don't I, I don't know that I have a lot of insight, but I guess and Christine, I would be comfortable if you have anything more you want to say, but Christine's working on a consulting on a project with me and looking at the map, it's like, oh, that is what's happening right now. Um, so there we it was we are trying to land the connection questions and they're not we thought we were close to landing I thought we were close to landing and then it's there's this there's both some social some mistrust issues going on underlying what we can't reach a decision and then there's the technical um as well and so it was just it's a, it's just a moment in the life of this project in this change effort but even in that moment the landscape diagram is really helpful as a way to think about what's going on so yeah just appreciating that yeah yeah before we pick on curtis does anyone else have anything that they want to question or comment on or thoughts they want to share okay curtis picking on you oh mary you're muted. I uh, appreciate um, the comment you made about, um, I forgot what I was gonna say now. Um, uh, uh, that you can uh, 
For instance, if they use social system mapping as a tool, um, you can, and are thinking that way, you can miss a lot of potential and opportunities. And I think in terms of the past, social system mapping may have been seen as a tool and attractive, attracting people as a tool. Mm -hmm. And um, gratefully, you've been spending a lot of time working on what it is as a process, not a product. That's it. Thanks. I'll just add to that, that, I mean, I've been doing this work, we developed some app and then sort of developed the, the framing around the way, the way that's around what social system mapping is based on what was technically possible. And I started this, I mean, as a software, I mean, I have an interest in complexity and systems thinking and network weaving, but I was a software developer and we made, um, I mean, we made maps for people and I totally approached this from a, here's the process, here's, here's the technology, here's what we need to do, like, how are we building this? And, um, and it is just from observing that when you approach it that way, it doesn't, like if one person makes all the decisions and then they're trying to engage people uh, after it's done, it just never really takes, it just never really becomes compelling for people or meaningful for people. And often people think it will solve all their problems. Like, oh, we'll just put this thing in place and it will solve all their problems. My experience is it just plain doesn't. So that's been my motivation for this pushing. Also, Tanya. Yeah, thanks. I, just to build on what you say, it's because we're very interested in actually using some app with our network. Um, uh, we have Kumu. Um, I'm just curious from this group, like, how do you go about introducing, like, to your point about, like, how do you introduce systems thinking to a group of older adults? How do you how do you help people see? And then I have, you know, more practical questions because some of our network are um, not as keen to use technology. So how can we engage with them for that ongoing um, data that they could share and seeing the value? What I really like about this is the integration um, of the monitoring, the reflection, because from uh, an improvement perspective, you know, you, you constantly need sources of data to reflect with the team to understand, are we moving in the direction we want to be moving in? Mm -hmm. And they couldn't quite understand, you know, what those metrics might be, but really in a network, it's, it's a living thing, mm -hmm. right? Like it's going to ebb and flow, the dy dynamic nature of it. So how do you have that real-time information that as a group, you can look at and decide where you need to go? Um, so, sorry, lots of questions in there, but that's kind of where my head's at is, I'm not sure where to start um, because I don't want to be the group that goes off and maps and says, hey, yeah. like, you know, yeah. what do you guys want to add? What's missing? It's like, no, that's not the point. It's not the map. It's the discussion. Yeah. Well, and so um, we have since, and, and I'm, I apologize for not tracking the time as closely as I might have been. So I was forewarning us, but um, so we have five minutes left. And so we should wrap up and I, those are really valuable questions that we are sort of all always exploring in these Monday sessions. First, second, um, um, the one thing that has I have seen be useful, and I think Tom has done this, and Amy has done this, and Curtis has have done this, and I've done it a few times now, of uh, is to start with a prototype of a map and and have it be super simple, but just some people doing some connections with like no survey data. It's very, it's so, it's so abstracted down that no one can think that this is what you're actually going to ask, but that you have nodes and lines and you show people how the technology works. And I understand like, if you have people who are not going to be uh, super excited about technology, they can usually think it's really cool if they can watch somebody else do it. So really reducing the demand on their literal physical engagement with technology and but showing them what's possible and then at just about every step my answer is getting closer and closer to being 
and then ask a bunch of questions. So just like, here's a possibility. How do you think this could help us? What do you think we could do with it? What might we want to know? And just open up a conversation. How could this be valuable for us? And facilitate the conversation and then follow those answers. And if the whole group says, this sucks and I would be horrified if we did this, then you kind of have like, okay, I need to back up and maybe wait a year or two. <laughs> but um, but then you know, and you haven't wasted your time on that. And generally that won't come up. What will come up is more, you know, sort of maybe this would be helpful or maybe that would be helpful. And then you sort of follow that. Well, I mean, they're already wondering like, how do I make the they're, they're like, we need a directory. I need to be able to, I want to know what people are working on. So I was trying to take that angle, but that's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. So we're getting to the end and um, um, Carol, are you ready to make an announcements? Thank you. As okay. always, yes. Uh, let me just switch my tabs here. Um, so our next Monday sense making session will be on the first Monday of November. Uh, we did not chat if that's back to an Amy and Curtis amalgamation or not, but usually either Christine, Amy, or Curtis is our presenter for those. Um, and then on our second Monday this month, it's October 14th, we do have a new map to look at from our community member, Evan. I never say his last name correct. Is it Curis? Curis? It's, I think it's Curis. Curis. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and that will be on uh, kind of a mobility constellations map in his state of Massachusetts. Uh, and then on our third Monday, we have a deep dive that'll be October 21st. And Sarah Shanahan, another community member, will be joining us to come back and share more about the results from uh, the Reamp Network's ripple effects map and what they've learned from that. And I will put links in the chat in just a moment here. Thank you. Okay, well, um, we will, I'll just, we'll, we have a goodbye ritual, which is sim very simple. We just all unmute. Anybody who's willing to do this, we just all unmute. I'll count down three, two, one. When I get to one, we just all, we like to have a, cl a clear, I like clear closure. And so um, we'll just all uh, say, give each other at the same time, verbally out loud, give each other our blessings and our well wishes for the day. And then we all jump off. So, um, Go ahead and unmute if you're going to do this with us. And three, I'm waiting for unmutings. <laughs> Two, one. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Have a wonderful Bye. Monday. Bye. Happy to see new faces. Thank Bye. you. Bye.